before you get completely tired and worn out, this is our last session, and it's the session on our humanitarian work. I just wanted to show you um, the Humanitarian Action Global Annual Results Report. Most of you have seen them in the back, uh, but I wanted to show you this one. All of the other global thematic funds have one, and it's, it's really great. So I, I read this entire one. Have a look at it. There are interesting examples in it on the impact of the work that might be useful to you and your audiences. And without further ado, I will introduce Emmanuel, 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 Emmanuel Fontaine, who is our Director of Emergency Programs and who will uh, guide us through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I know it's been a long, I believe it's been a long day uh, for everyone, but uh, you know, it's not very nice out there, so you're not missing anything about sitting out there. Um, so we, let's talk about the major in action. I'm sure my colleagues before have talked quite a bit about programs in general, and I'm sure a lot of it was also related to the work we're doing in humanitarian settings. So uh, I'll try not to repeat too many of those, but I think there might be also um, you know, points and you want to raise during the questions. So um, the, if you look back at 2018, um, the number of the, um, the I mean, humanitarian needs have continued growing in 2018 quite substantially. And it's interesting, too, if you look at the United Nations-led uh, assistance, humanitarian assistance, it has increased, the target for humanitarian assistance has increased from 77 million people we were targeting in 2014 to more than 100 million in 2018. Another important element is conflict have remained the primary driver of, of humanitarian um, needs in general, with about 400, we, we estimate about 420 million children affected by conflict. Uh, violence has also continued to deepen in some of the countries in the protectorate crisis that you've been used to hear about. Unfortunately, the Yemen, the Syria, um, the uh, DRC, Nigeria, Somalia, and other such places. Many crises have resulted in, uh, in mass displace displacement. Uh, 69 million people on the move. That's what we had in 2018, 69 people, million on the move and more than half of the world refugees being children, which is always something we need to remember. More than a half of the, refugee children, uh, the refugees are children. Um, we also, which is very worrying, we've also noted that the number of grave violations as we monitor them through a monitoring and reporting system, the number of grave violations against children in conflict has actually nearly tripled since 2010, nearly tripled the number of grave violations we've been able to verify in conflict situations. Uh, obviously, food insecurity and extreme weather events have also uh, compounded the effects of crisis. And then in many occasions, we've had crisis on top of crisis. One such, obviously, has been Ebola in the DRC, uh, a, you know, a health outbreak in, on top of, uh, of, um, of a conflict situation. Or obviously, cholera in Yemen and many other such situations. Um, yeah. So let me now talk to I mean, about the, our global response in 2018. So UNICEF and our partners, uh, obviously national governments, civil society partners, international, national civil society partners, we've responded to 285 humanitarian situations of various scales, obviously, in 90 countries. So when I said 285 uh, crisis situations, again, it's everything. It's from the fairly localized flood in, uh, in a part of a country where you respond maybe in a matter of a couple of weeks to obviously the protracted uh, crisis and emergencies that take a lot more attention and time. Uh, you might notice it's actually a decrease from last year because we are at more than we were at more than 300 last year, and it's probably because we've had actually less such of the small scale uh, crisis to respond to uh, during the year, less of, of those. But we still had five level three emergencies and six level two emergencies to manage those emergencies that require the organization to pull behind and actually uh, provide additional support. And obviously, we have also had to uh, deal with protracted crises that have become increasingly com complex in nature. Again, Ebola in the RC or, or cholera in Yemen as, uh, as examples. We've achieved great results. Um, so that's the good news. We've achieved great results during the, the course of the year. And uh, these are the indicators we do follow through from one year to the other. Uh, and they're basically one indicator for each of the areas where we're, we're intervening. So just to give you a sense, as you can see here, but just maybe to, to mention to you, 43.6 million children get, getting access to safe water, 3.4 million children receiving treatment for severe acute malnutrition, 3.6 million children uh, have been receiving uh, psychosocial support, 
close to 20 million children immunized against measles. Close to 7 million children actually able to access both uh, some form of education, either formal or non-formal education in, in crisis situations. And uh, 2.4 million children benefiting from cash-based support. Again, these are the results of humanitarian action. We did provide such services also through our development assistance with our development partners. Uh, hence, the, you know, the, the results uh, are, are bigger. But this is through humanitarian action in humanitarian situations. So just to give you a couple of examples here, um, you know, more, more specific example, like for example, in Bangladesh, 382,000 people affected uh, by the refugee crisis provided with safe water and 1.2 million people with cholera vaccination. Please note also that the 1.2 million people is actually both refugees and host population. We've had 1 million uh, refugees immunized and 200,000 people in host communities because obviously cholera doesn't decide if you're a refugee or you're, you're a host. Um, but that's pretty significant. That really has avoided a major, major uh, crisis in, in uh, Bangladesh in the refugee camps. In South Sudan, more than 257 children reached with psychosocial support and 180,000 people reached with gender-based violence prevention and response services. In some cases, prevention services, in some cases, the very kind of case management of a, of a, of a gender-based violence uh, case. And in Yemen, uh, I was talking about cash support. In Yemen, we've actually provided uh, with the World Bank, support of the World Bank, um, we've provided actually cash, emergency cash uh, transfers to 1.4 million households. These are households. Uh, so it's actually about 8 million people, slightly more than 8 million people actually receiving these. So um, obviously, as we do our response, we also try to make it more and more professional. We try to make it stronger, more effective, more efficient. Um, and in line with obviously the commitment we've taken uh, in, in the past and that we want to make sure we're, we're delivering on. Um, so obviously we've been working on strengthening the humanitarian development nexus. This whole work we're trying to do increasingly. There was a presentation on our executive board in February on, on this, um, how we can throw humanitarian action, start developing systems and building or, or rebuilding resilience of communities and services and systems, uh, but also how through our, human, our development assistance, we can actually reduce risk and vulnerabilities and try to manage them better. So just to give you an example, in the Philippines where we did uh, do a water response, which was an emergency water response providing water directly to people, we did also repair water sources and, uh, and train 61 uh, mem staff members from municipalities to actually manage, test, and manage the quality and test the quality of water. Uh, so these people, as we speak, are still working on actually managing water quality in those areas, so beyond the actual emergency response. Um, obviously, uh, the localization of humanitarian action or commitment to try to work better with local partners and, and frontline organizations. And just to give you an example, in Iraq, more than 82% of actually all the fund that have been transferred to implementing partners in general actually went uh, to local and national partners. So, and I, I'll get back on this a little bit later on because we have a, a more global number, but. 82% in the case of Iraq, going through frontline national and local organizations. Um, increasing the use of cash-based cash sorry, programming. This is the example I mentioned to you in Yemen, but there are many other places where we do use cash at the moment as a way, as one of the tool, if you will, in the toolbox of humanitarian action uh, through which we can actually provide response. Um, obviously, ensuring that programs are informed by risk. That is the development, that is when we do our country program document, uh, documents and, and we develop our country programs. How do we make sure this country program takes into account the particular risk faced by population? And I think Rwanda has had a good example of um, the country program in Rwanda from 2018 to 2023 actually is looking at the risks uh, around environmental risks and disease outbreaks in particular, and also refugees, potential refugee movement uh, in the country program, which is actually very uh, innovative and important for us. Investing in preparedness and risk analysis is all the work we've been doing on preparedness. I'm happy to comment more on that, but just to give you an example, Uganda getting ready for Ebola. Uh, we know Ebola is in the DRC. It's not very far from Uganda. Uganda has had Ebola before, um, and, uh, and the work being done to prepare for the Ebola outbreak is actually very significant at the moment, and hope we don't have to use it, obviously. Um, obviously, addressing um, fragility, building peace. We've had some interesting work in Colombia, for example. 
uh, with uh, you know, more than 4,000 girls and boys being trained into organizing community dialogue and discussions around some specific issues, which have been quite, uh, quite remarkable. And uh, accountability to affected population, to give you an example in Syria, for example, we had a, a feedback mechanism for which we're collecting feedback on the use of, uh, of uh, hygiene uh, items in, and, and toilets and, and health, uh, toilet facilities in schools. And then we've been able to actually adapt them and, and make them more responsive and more adapted to girls in particular in those situations. Obviously, we cannot do emergency response without having people on the ground. Um, and obviously, we do work mostly, as you know, first of all, with the team that is on the ground. UNICEF is before, during, and after an emergency in all the countries to which we respond. But in addition to that, in addition to the people we have there, we need to deploy surge capacity and we need to deploy additional capacities in general. Last year, we actually deployed 461 people to emergencies, uh, to respond to emergencies. 165 of them were standby partners. Standby partners are those organizations that have a standby arrangement with UNICEF and that actually do offer to uh, send uh, um, capacities and, and people in all kinds of, of work. It could be on water, it could be on security, it could be on communication. It's in all the areas in which we're working. And 134 were actually there to support, among, among these 461 personnel, 134 to support our cluster function and coordination, which is an important commitment of the organization. Now, we also have an emergency response team in UNICEF. It has been increased. Uh, now it is at 22 people, but I think we might actually look to make it even uh, larger. These are the colleagues who actually are deployable anytime, and this is their function. This is their role. This is what they're doing, going to the field it could be doing that for child protection. It can be doing it in coordination in general. It could be operations, administrations. It could be security. And these are specialized colleagues who actually are available at any time and really make a huge difference. Because you know, you're know you in a situation, you're a bit overwhelmed by your, your crisis in the country, and then you get people who come and help you and know exactly what you need to do. Um, so it's been quite important. And then maybe just one last point, which is also really very much linked to uh, a strong commitment from executive director on the prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. UNICEF has also committed $11 million of its own resources in 16 countries to build the capacity there on the ground to actually, you know, including of partners to, to be able to make sure we prevent and, and avoid um, uh, uh, sexual exploitation and abuse in, in, in those situations where uh, people are particularly vulnerable. Um, supplies and logistics, this is the other, we need people, we need supplies, supplies and logistics. Um, the procurement for emergencies uh, in 2018 reached more than 410 million, 412 million uh, dollars globally and went to 53 countries and territories, as you can see here. Um, um, most of them went to L2 and L3 emergencies, obviously, and the, the commodity that has been the most uh, dispatched to emergency response has been vaccines by, by, by a, a large margin. So, well, almost 80 million, 76.4 million dollars worth of vaccine and uh, other biological products that have actually been sent to emergencies. Third component, so staff, supplies, third component partnerships, which are extremely important. Um, we've had actually, and this is pretty, pretty impressive, if you look at the number there, UNICEF in its humanitarian response across the world has actually made, has actually had the partnership with 1,403 partners across the, across the world, 1,403 partners. And 67% of these partners were actually local and national partners. So again, brings us back to the localization discussion earlier and the localization agenda. 67% of our partners are actually local and national frontline organizations, to which we've actually, uh, um, I mean, the overall transfer to civil society partners has been at $575 million. $575 million have been transferred to partners. Out of that, 54% were actually to local and national partners. So, the majority of our partnerships, but also the majority of the resources being transferred to partners actually went to frontline organizations and national organizations. Now, obviously, uh, all that has been done, has not been done with, without challenges and issues and, and, and lessons we've learned along the way. Um, one is obviously humanitarian access has unfortunately remain extremely constrained and constrained by a lot of different parameters, security, um, difficulties. I mentioned earlier the behavior of, um, of uh, warring parties the, um, the, and, and the risks that it represents, but also sometimes access is also an issue of resources and funding and capacities to actually bring services uh, to people. Uh, so for example, just to give you an example, in the Central African Republic, with the issues of humanitarian access that are particularly difficult in this country, but also 
issues around funding, we've been able to provide access to safe water to just less than one third of our target. So we had planned to actually bring safe uh, water to 600,000 people, but we've only been able to do that to, one, to just one third of them. Um, the other, obviously, issue is the disrespect of uh, international uh, human, humanitarian and human rights law in general by warring parties, and that translates in many different ways. Attacks on schools and hospitals, you know, you've heard a lot of what was happening in Yemen, for example, and other, other places. Attacks on schools in Mali, attacks on schools in Burkina Faso recently. Um, that are extremely serious, but also the attacks on humanitarian workers. And uh, we have registered, it's not on UNICEF, for all humanitarian workers, almost 300 incidents or 300 workers actually victim of grave uh, or major attacks uh, during the course of the year. So that's um, a very worrying trend. Um, and, uh, and you know, when, one of the questions I'm often asked actually uh, is, is that getting worse? Uh, and, you know, having done humanitarian action for quite a few years now, I would say, I think for me, what is getting worse is that the simple fact of being a humanitarian actor exposes you. So it's not anymore you are at the wrong place at the wrong time and, you know, things are dangerous and you're in an environment that is dangerous. Is that you're actually deliberately targeted because you're trying to bring education or you're trying to bring health services to a particular population, which I think is an extremely uh, worrying trend. Um, obviously, UNICEF country offices sometimes have to uh, struggle the balance between the coverage, the quality, the equity, bring as much attention and humanitarian assistance to a large number of people who are trying to really, really target the most in need um, uh, and looking at quality, obviously, because we want to make sure we bring a certain level of quality. So sometimes it happens that, you know, first wave is the rapid wave of bringing large assistance to a large population and progressively trying to build in the capacity and the quality of the response uh, a little bit more. Timeliness is also something, sometimes be an issue. Timeliness uh, might have been a problem in some cases that we were not as fast as we would have wanted in a particular response. Timeliness the, or the lack of can be linked to many different factors. Maybe a lack of reaction at times, maybe a lack of leadership of a government in an area. It might be also in some cases the resources are not there. We made a large use of our emergency program fund, our EPF, which is this discretionary fund that we have, uh, which is funded from core resources and is so important in making sure that we can actually front load some of the resources rapidly into a country offices for a response. So it's been extremely important. Staffing shortages have been issues. Um, it is, um, you know, uh, we've had surge requests that we haven't been able to meet. We've had difficulties in some cases finding the right profile, the right people at the right time. And honestly, it's not getting any easier to actually find people to actually just send to some of the areas and the places where we work that are dangerous. I think we have a very clear commitment in UNICEF to be closer and closer to the people we're trying to help. We're trying to decentralize. We have actually pretty decentralized presence in a lot of those countries in very remote locations, but it's not very easy to find the people to actually do that and, and are available on, on short notice. And then uh, the, obviously the lack of unearmarked and multi-year funding has been a bit of an issue and I'll get back to it in, in a second. But uh, just to give you an example in Nigeria, um, the lack of longer term and flexible funding around health has not allowed us to do some of the infrastructure work and the reinforcement of the health system we wanted to do and procurement of health uh, equipment that we wanted to do for a better quality of health care, uh, simply because we just didn't have the, the means to do so. Very rapidly, resource mobilization. Thanks to the generous contribution of all our donors, uh, governments, uh, national uh, committees, private sector, private individuals, um, and, and the private sector in general, uh, we've actually reached Two billion. We've actually we, we had a, a humanitarian appeal at the beginning of the year of 3.8 billion. We've actually managed to uh, raise two billion dollars, which means a funding gap of 46 percent. Um, another point which is important to note is that 92 percent of those two billion, 92 percent were earmarked. So only eight percent were not earmarked. And when I say eight percent non earmarked, actually uh, only 1.7 percent of this eight percent was actually not earmarked at all in global humanitarian thematic, as I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, and so that has consequences. Some of the shortfalls are having some serious consequences. Like for example, in Mali, I didn't mention Nigeria earlier. I didn't mention the Central African Republic. In Mali, only 35% of the children we had targeted for education services have been provided with some form of education because we just didn't have the resources. The global thematic funding, uh, thematic humanitarian funding. So uh, we did receive $30 million, almost $30 million of global humanitarian thematic last year. That's the fully on your mark fund that we can use for humanitarian action. Of these, a bit more than 20 million were allocated to country and regional offices. 
particularly um, those least funded, the, you know, the, the, the emergencies in which there is not a whole lot of attention, or the sector in the crisis that is not getting the right of funding, and the, the right kind of, uh, of support. Um, obviously, and another seven, about more than seven million was actually um, there to support emergency deployment, clusters, coordination functions, advocacy, probably work we did. And 1.8, and that's the new thing, $1.8 million has actually been used for preparedness effort, what we call early action, this capacity that we have to be able to front load some resources for a country uh, ahead of a particular crisis that we, we think. We just, for example, now in touch, I mean, that's 2019, but for just to give you an example, with the Haiti, the Haiti country office was asking for some support to be able to actually uh, face a particular crisis or a risk of crisis with the hurricane season, season coming in. Uh, we did for, also do a, a, a strong uh, preparedness action in Gaza ahead of the latest crisis, which allowed us to actually have drugs and, and, and uh, health equipment in, in health facilities ahead of, of the blockade and the difficulties there. Um, so it is, it is extremely important. And in the, new, in the new report, there is now an annex that actually allows you to look a little bit at how we've used the global humanitarian thematics. So I invite you to just have a look at it when you have a chance. I'm finishing very rapidly um, on the expenses. Um, this is really important to also realize that in the year in 2018, more or less in the same line as we've had in the past two or three years, but 50% uh, of the overall organizational expenses in 2018 uh, were actually humanitarian expenses. So there's the, that's about $2.7 billion. So there's the $2 billion we received, plus some allocation for humanitarian action of some of the regular resources and some of the other resources that were earmarked towards actually a humanitarian response or humanitarian action. Um, and the goal area, one of the strategic plan was actually almost 40% of all of our expenses. So the, the more, if you will, survival aspect of our, of our work. Um, well, I'm not gonna go through that too much. It's just the future work plan. I mean, this is more or less the points that I've made earlier about our own capacity and the way we work on our own capacity. Obviously, improving framework for humanitarian access. This is one of the work we're getting an increasing number of access advisors. We have actually developed a number of tools to help colleagues work on access. Access has become a major issue. We need to become a lot more professional about it and, and the way we negotiate. And I was just in Burkina Faso, for example, trying to look on how now we're accessing some of the zones that, um, that are becoming extremely difficult. Improving humanitarian leadership. We've created a whole uh, team that is working on learning and evidence uh, generation, which is uh, for us extremely important. How do we generate evidence and, and learn? Uh, preparedness, I didn't mention. Cash transfers, I didn't mention. Joining the assessment report, um, plan, response planning in general. Um, the whole issue of the feedback of affected population, and we can talk about it more if you will. And uh, obviously, the whole issue of mobilizing flexible funding. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Yes, no, we can share. It's fine. And um, we'll open up for, for the questions. Please introduce yourself because Manuel has just joined us. And, um, and uh, I didn't just join UNICEF, right? Yes, of course. Of course. So, of course. So there are many colleagues here. So I want to say we are actually from program and, and yes. can also chip in for please feel free if you you know um, can bring an illustration if you are in a number of different groups. Please feel free to do that. Great. Who would like to start? You, would you like to any questions? I can also or warm you up or, or comments. Or yeah. or not, I mean, no, Maybe I'll I'll help with Misha, Germany, please. Hi, thank you, Misha from Germany. Um, so maybe a question on the um, localization you mentioned. A um, lot of funds going through local actors, and I think you're already over your 2018 milestones, but congratulations on that. Um, could you speak a little bit to the challenges that you have? Yes, today, working more and more with these type of actors, also looking at access. I think that's a point on the evaluation that came out. Shall we see if there's another question? Yes. Uh, thank you very much, Manuel, for this uh, overview. Um, my name is Philip from uh, Switzerland. 
I would be interesting to know more about where are we now in terms of counter counterterrorism, the impact you know of the new regulation, uh, and how this is constraining uh, UNICEF uh, actions. And the second uh, question is, um, as usual, we ask you know about a UN organization to work together. So where are we in terms of the uh, implementation of the commitment you know um, of the global compact you know uh, um, so yeah I would like to see where we are in terms of the working together uh, in humanitarian settings you know both natural disaster as well as man-made uh, disaster in particular sorry just sorry I didn't I, no I, I was referring to the um, to the uh, I, sorry uh, the I have a lapse of memory uh, the uh, the commitments that I was done in 2016, you know, like the... The Grand Bargain. Yeah, the Grand Bargain. Okay, yeah. sure. Thank you very much. And that, you can also come in on this one. Uh, yeah. Maybe I can start. Oh, sorry, there's another, there's a few others. Shall we take... Uh, thank you, Tony Stewart from Australia. That was um, absolutely fantastic because when I arrived at UNICEF three years ago, the Australian government wouldn't allow UNICEF to be part of a humanitarian matching appeal because it didn't at the time, the particular individuals, I should say, believed we were only a development organization mm -hmm. and not a humanitarian <laughs> emergency organization. And I think it's really important that we can get both messages across. And I'm particularly interested in your thoughts around your emergency response team. You mentioned 22. Um, from personal experience, I was in PNG when the earthquakes came, and for funding reasons, only one person could come out from the region. I think at an absolute minimum, you must have two. It needs to be someone who can get to where the emergency is, and somebody who is working with the host government. And uh, I, if that's a funding issue, can you please tell us all, because we really need to help you get those numbers beyond 22. Thank you. Hi, this is uh, Celia from Norway. I wondered if you could speak a little bit about how UNICEF is engaging in the work to prevent the military use of schools and also attacks on education. Thank you. Maybe we'll just start with some answers and then open up again. Yes. Thanks, very good questions and very helpful. And again, if some of the colleagues want to ship in, please don't hesitate to do so. Uh, I think on localization, it's you're right. I mean, and I think one of the issues is we need progressively to move away from an indicator which is looking at how much resources we have transferred, which I think is important. And and uh, you know, 67% of our partners are local partners. That gives that sense that we, yes, we are, uh, you know, we're reaching out, but also we are accessible, and then we can work with local organizations, which I think is important. But we're facing a number of challenges around localization. One challenge is obviously a capacity issue. It's fine to transfer resources, but if you don't transfer capacity and, and training and management in general, particularly management training, I think you're, you're, you're taking a risk. Um, and that's something we're doing increasingly now, um, and we need to continue working on. But it has to be part of our, uh, of you know, we don't just happy to transfer resources, but make sure we transfer knowledge, management capacities, and, and, and you know, working framework to work with. Um, and so that's that's increasing, and I you know there's a number of examples at some point I can share with you if you want some, some of the places where we're doing that. We're having a discussion with the IFRC, for example, around the Red Cross, um, where they want us to help them uh, build the capacity of some of the national societies that are maybe a bit weaker than others in some cases. I think the other big preoccupation I have around localization is we also don't want to use local organizations just as a way to transfer a risk we don't want to take ourselves. Um, and we don't want to be in that situation. And, uh, you know, it was for me very striking. I just had a discussion. I was in Burkina Faso with the colleagues. We went to Dori, went to the north, trying to see what's going on there. You know, when you see that the people who actually get killed are teachers, they are you know, health workers, they are. And, and so we cannot be in that situation where we're just basically saying, well, you should go out there and teach um, if the results of people are going to get killed. And, and it should never be about us not wanting to take a risk, therefore someone else got to take it for us. There are cases where being national, local exposes you to less risk because you're, you know, you're just somehow, you understand your community, you, you know you're more accepted, it's easier, you're less targeted maybe at times. There are cases where it's not the case. And so one thing we're really pushing is the use of the you know, saving lives together framework and, and, and make sure we, our security colleagues really help the, the national organizations and also help our own colleagues 
determine when it's reasonable to ask a particular risk taking and when it's not reasonable and we shouldn't do it. Um, but again, it should never be about transferring the same risk that we're facing or even a risk higher to someone else. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's an issue. We're also looking at the moment, the whole issue of hostage taking, for example, retraining, uh, making sure we have a common understanding around the UN, but also training our colleagues better because we know that there are cases, and including for, you know, for implementing partners, we, we know that actually we've had more uh, colleagues from implementing organizations being taken hostage than UNICEF staff members. So we need to be able to help them in situations like this. So absolutely agree with you. And I think it, it has to be part of a package. And I think progressively we would have to move away from an indicator that just shows the resources that are being transferred to really looking at capacities and, and knowledge and, and all that we've transferred. Uh, Switzerland on, on counterterrorism, that's, uh, that's a big issue. Um, I think it still remains, uh, it really still remains a, a complex issue and Burkina Faso is one good example for you, you know, there. For example, as you know, um, there's been a reaction um, with the situation happening in the north and the east of the country, the deployment of armed groups coming from Mali and, and other resources and progressively creating this kind of vacuum in which basically they can establish themselves and also creating this terrible intercommunal violence and, and, and violence in general. And it's the very typical pattern of, you know, of this group to install their, their own capacities and their own authority over a particular population and particular area. And so there is that, as, there is that, that um, engagement that we have to try to move in and, and try to create space where services have been provided, where the population doesn't feel marginalized and forgotten. And therefore, where maybe uh, the space is a little bit more, um, you know, um, somehow less less conducive to, to those groups in general. But at the same time, we've got to be very clear. It's going to be about humanitarian needs. It's going to be about development needs. It's not our agenda. It's not about countering terrorism. It's about making sure that people's needs are actually being taken care of. Where it becomes complicated is unfortunately, um, you know, in many cases, uh, resources and, uh, and, and, uh, and some of the contributions we're receiving become increasingly marked and increasingly conditioned, let's say. Um, to a number of conditions, such as make sure that this is not going to be used in a, you know, in an area that is under the control of this or that group, or make sure. So it's not anymore about needs; it's really about who is in control of what. Um, and so we're pushing back on this because we think it's important. But I think really this is a dialogue we would want donors to have um, among among yourselves in general, and saying so. How do we make sure, you know, that the humanitarian mission is so important, so essential, and it, and it. Um, and it is so important because in many occasions, frankly, that's the last thing that this is the this is the last frontier. This is the last thing that people actually see of internal international solidarity uh, and caring is, is humanitarian action. So if we don't do that anymore, we're actually creating an environment which is much more likely uh, to see those groups develop and, and, and flourish. So I think it's counterproductive in general. So we're, we really need to have this conversation with all of you. And please, uh, I think among donors, just realize we understand the concerns. We understand uh, the, the constraints by parliaments, in particular, as making you know very clear demands on on civil servants and the administration. Uh, but we're quite happy to also engage with parliaments with you on on those discussions and saying, well, is it really the result that you want? That basically all the only marks of international solidarity disappear because because that's not politically correct. Is it really not going to be fully counterproductive? And is it really what the action is about? So. It's complicated, but happy to have this conversation further and, and continue having it. On the grand bargain, maybe you want to give us a couple of... Just a few words. So we met recently uh, in Geneva for the grand bargain, and the next meeting is in a couple of weeks in, in Geneva. It's being reinvigorated. For those of you who have been following, so grand bargain for humanitarian funding compact for development, we talked about the two speaking with each other at some point, if you think about the nexus. But just to say that we're empowered by the fact that uh, after a phase where UNICEF was a member of the facilitation group, after a phase of kind of calming down with the, the new eminent person who took over from Kristalina Georgieva, minister, the Dutch minister Kag, uh, minister of development, there is a willingness to reinvigorate this whole process. And we've given ourselves two years as a group of agencies and uh, partners, resource partners, to make a difference. So all the working streams will be reinvigorated and there is room for a lot of good work. And part of the discussions are discussions around conditionalities, the increased number of conditionalities, and how we make sure it's a bargain where um, from our side, the agencies, we coordinate better, we do things better, we make a better pitch for quality and unearmarked funding. 
needs assessment and all the different working streams, but also on the side of donors, and I reiterate what Manuel has just said, if the donors also could get together to streamline a little bit, because on the agencies, we feel that the whole burden of managing these increased conditionalities is entirely transferred to the agencies, which is something we can do, but it's very, very heavy in terms of transaction costs. And at some point, counterproductive and this whole dilemma we have of when do we refuse money and when do we keep taking it? And these are dilemmas we have practically every day today. So I'll just stop here, but but we're, we're really committed to this process. Now on the ERT, yes, we are a humanitarian organization, and uh, and uh, and I think I, I was hoping I demonstrated it, but it's uh, the ERT, this, the emergency response team, is really this capacity that we have to add this added, to bring in this added expertise and capacity at a given time when we need to move to you know a certain level of response. It, it doesn't substitute to the fact that we have the team on the ground. We have a country office. We have a country team. And the colleagues on the ground need to be owning that response because better than anyone else, they will know who the partners are, they will know what the environment is, they will know what the culture is. You know, they will be much more able to adapt. They will also be have, having a lot more in mind the kind of a longer term impact of their humanitarian assistance, making sure we don't do humanitarian assistance in the way that actually undermines resilience and systems that have been put in place for development. So it, it is important that it's still being owned by the team that is on the ground, has been working there for years and knows the environment better. The ERT is this capacity, this added capacity to say, well, you maybe don't have so much experience about dealing with unaccompanied children, uh, but we know how to do it. This is how you do it. This is how we're getting, you know, how we do these things. Or we open a sub office somewhere in the field somewhere, well, then we send someone who's a coordinator and that person can set the office, make it work, make, make it go and, and, and happen. So yes, we do need a little bit more ERT because we are under a lot of stress and demands at the moment because they're actually so useful to bring that added kind of, of, of value into it. Um, it's been a big effort the organization has made because most of them are now on core budget. So they are actually you know, part of our core team and this is really important. We're trying to do more. Um, again, you know, this is one of the things we're trying to do also in Mediterranean Action is, is really sure, make sure we act with no regrets. Uh, that you know, something happens that we're not going to look later on and say, well, we could, we should have done, we should have sent more people, we should have put more money, we should have tried more. It's really go, you know, head first and, and go fast. I think we did that when in Mozambique, for example, you know, front load rapidly, put some of the resources, the people, the partners and go fast. And then if things are not as bad as we, you know, feared, then, then we will scale down and, and reevaluate. But that, that implies we have resources that we can work with. And so hence the EPF, but also the global humanitarian thematic those resources we can front load and, and put up front before an appeal is even released uh, and, and the capacities and the people we can send. The standby partners and the ERT are the, are the key ones. So obviously, if we could increase, for example, I mean, I, I've seen um, our colleagues from the ERT on, uh, on human resources are very demanded. For example, the colleagues who go and help recruiting additional colleagues. Um, we've had on education, for example, I mean, there was a question on education. Education is one of the areas where our colleague is on, under a lot of demands because this is part of our early response and sometimes office is not really clear how do we do education in emergency uh, response at a given time. So happy if we could do more, we would want to have more than 22, uh, but we also monitor, we check during the year how many, you know, how long they've been deployed. Most of them have been deployed 70% of the time and really along 75%. Um, we, we check how long they've been deployed, and and then we, you know, if, if some have not been very well deployed, then we can we can reassess. We need one in. I'm just looking at Rafael. There, we we need someone on, on C4D. Clearly, communication for development is so important to make sure that we have the, the people to to do community engagement early on in emergency response. Finally, on education, I think there's many ways in which we're trying to engage on schools and attacks on schools. Uh, obviously, we're pushing all countries to sign the safe uh, safe school declaration. Um, I got Cameroon to sign it when I was there, and uh, you know, and I was so surprised that they signed it so rapidly uh, after, and, and others, and, and, and really commit to it and be serious about it and monitor that. We also have uh, you know, attacks on schools and, and hospitals. It's also part of the grave violations we are monitoring as part of our monitoring and reporting mechanism that is uh, sanctioned by the Security Council, and those reports we progress regularly which means that we also do name and shame parties to conflicts that actually are attacking schools uh, and, and health facilities or, or teachers. Um, and that's very strong there. We are trying to make it part of our advocacy systematically. 
Um, again, I can tell you that each time I go to, I mean, this, this is becoming a real issue in, in Burkina, in Mali, in Cameroon, and, you know, there's so many places where, again, being a teacher becomes almost a, a death sentence um, that, that we need to, to react. We, it's not always easy when you're dealing with some of those groups that are, frankly, not accountable to much, and so therefore, which we have little, uh, uh, on which we have little cloud. But this is really very central to our action. Um, and in some cases, it's basically trying to find alternatives if it becomes complicated. So whether it's, you know, education through the radios, whether that's uh, uh, other forms of non-formal education, try to start something, do something about it, and also making sure it's very central to our imagination action. Just as a reminder, the hack for 2019, more than 25% of the overall ask was for education. So actually, it's the biggest, it was the biggest uh, um, part of our budget, if you will, was education this, this year. So it, it is very central to what we're trying to do. So we, we're starting to run out of time, but maybe a final round of a couple of questions, if any. I'm just looking at the at the room. Yes, please, Misha again. And then I'll conclude with an example just to tease you and get you to uh, read the uh, report. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, maybe this is going to be too much of a topic to discuss now, but if you could speak quickly maybe to the World Bank partnership mentioned that in Yemen there's a lot of money going through cash assistance through the World Bank program and it's you know a growing area of, of cooperation and nobody really knows where it's going to be heading but I think it's an important aspect to look at and if there's any early lessons learned from from that partnership and how you see it for the future. I have some points that can happen. I, I mean yes as you said it's a longer term and then we might be useful to have a smaller group to discuss that with the with all the interested because I think it all of us are part of that lessons learned, if you will. I think Yemen is a very good example for us of a partnership that went very well. Again, it's been, I think we're at the fifth payment, uh, I think, at the moment. Um, so it's basically, again, more than 8 million people receiving cash on a, you know, on, uh, on a, on a regular basis and actually highly vulnerable people. We've agreed to them on the way we would do things. I think it's a good example of where UNICEF can add value because we're out there, because we are in those most fragile environments where maybe it's a little bit more uncomfortable for the World Bank to act at some point, or maybe they don't have the same capacity, where we can actually be there and, 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 and deliver some of that because we are, this is what, what, part of what we do is, is also work in very high risk environments and be able to do it. We've also, I was in chat with them when we you know, started to look at the FAM, the famine action mechanism, uh, which is also very interesting, this idea of front-loading rapidly when things get wrong and, and when you're moving from APC3 to potentially APC4 and then you need to make sure you get the resources and don't wait until you have a real famine declared to actually do something. And there again, it's, you know, in, particularly in countries, uh, I mean, they were looking at Somalia, South Sudan, uh, Chad, countries where in some cases governments, frankly, are not going to have the capacity to actually manage. Um, and this is where I think partners like UNICEF can offer our networks or capacities or uh, you know, our capacity to actually deliver the assistance and, and work with them. Now, I think we need just to do a bit of a, you know, as you said, the stock uh, taking on, on, on some of these, and I'm sure they have their own lessons learned on how they work with us. What I, what I see, and I don't know if you, you, you can correct me, contradict me, Carla, if you want, but I think I see increasing interest towards our capacity to be in very fragile environment and uh, high risk environment and deliver some assistance at the same time where they feel they're need to actually be more proactive and be there earlier and, and link that you mentioned development um, gap. I think you've said it all, but uh, there is growing interest in FCV, so uh, fragility, conflict, and violence context where they cannot operate themselves. And you've said it, Manuel. Maybe just to say, um, having managing the team that's leading on the discussions and negotiations with them, it's been um, a, 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 an uphill battle in a sense, which is normal because two partners, different business models, different, uh, the World Bank is not a bank just to finance the UN system, it, it's a bank, so it's a development bank. So we had to adjust, but we have experience also with others and we're learning from it. What is amazing is the level of learning and lessons learned that is being shared and the trust that was built over the past few years. And Yemen was the key uh, launching pad for that. So now they've they've invested also in South Sudan, and they're looking at which agency covers what to do it in the most uh, appropriate and comprehensive way. So a lot, uh, a lot to learn from, and a lot of potential, especially for the nexus. Any final question? Then maybe before we conclude, I just want, as a teaser, to read to you a sentence from the report. 
so maybe on your flight back, it's, it's something that struck me and that I wanted to share with you. Uh, on preparedness that is generally underfunded or doesn't attract the levels of funding we would want, prevention, preparedness, everything linked to that field, just to tell you how much value for money there is in this field, for every $1 invested early in high-risk humanitarian context, we save more than $4 on average against the next emergency. And there's a whole case study around that. And I think these are the examples you can use in helping us make the case uh, on your side. And hopefully you will look into this wonderful report that has amazing examples in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel, for an inspiring presentation. And thank you for being with us since 9 a.m. for some of you. I've seen some faces stay the whole day. Thank you very much. We rely on your support. We treasure it. Uh, please do not hesitate to give us any kind of feedback you may have on this session. This is the first time we design it this way. We're learning. We want to improve anything you might want us to know. Don't hesitate. A big thank you to all of you. Thank you.